Dr. Castleberry here with part two of our asynchronous dialogue for creating social media presence and cultural movements. We are flying through questions today. We're tackling questions from Michael at the moment, um, asking about confessional versus controversial uh, 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 approaches, but coming out of chapter two um, from our book on, uh, let's see, is it? Ah, yes, uh, Lee Potter's interviewing for journalists, right? Which you don't have to be planning to be a journalist in the future to gain a lot from these readings and hopefully we, that we all recognize that right off the bat, right? This is not a, an exclusive course to that. If you're a researcher, you need good interviewing techniques. If you're a, if you're if you're a, 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 a plan to be an employer of any kind, you need good interviewing techniques. Okay? If you're going to apply and interview for jobs in the future, you need good interviewing techniques, all right? So this is not exclusive to journalism. I want to make sure we're all on the same page there. Question about number two, communicating and interviewing. Is there ever a point during an interview when the interviewer has to discontinue the process due to the sensitivity of the interviewee? And how's it determined? Okay. Uh, I Well, I can't speak for all journalists because different folks have different styles and that's less common, right? Less common than you would anticipate. But you don't want to push someone beyond their level of comfort because that also, I think that's the important point, we don't want to cross that ethical boundary of pushing someone beyond the point um, to where they might feel um, the interview is disingenuous or, or, or that, 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 that exchange is compromised, right? Your communication exchange is compromised in any way. Um, there are those kinds of legalities, and in, in, in addition to media law and ethics, are uh, another comp course we offer. If you're following that direction, more training would be would be needed, and there are great sources out there to help us advance advance our understanding of those ethics. Let's tackle a couple of questions from Brittany, starting with questions from uh, Scott Goodson's Uprising. All right, um, how do movements and protests m move? so quickly from being peaceful and powerful to being violent and oppressive of the first amendment rights of others uh, mm, idk right <laughs> let me idk um I, what what when do when 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 do movements do that um not very often i think is the is the authentic answer not very often um i think and then i think when that public perception is created that these that these movements social cultural movements are are leading to riots and things, that's a that's a miss reading of of what's really going on in culture and society right that's or at least in the u.s okay so there are examples especially involved in sort of a politically unstable and volatile uh, con uh, uh, countries, right? Abroad, um, but this is uh, it's irregular because um, we're still we're still kicking, right? Uh, te technically classified as a democracy, um, so it depends on the circumstances. Would be the best way to answer that. Is it uh, is it truly a positive business move to support or even stand against certain movements? This is a good question, right? I like what this is getting at is. Is is there a price to pay? Okay, is this uh, what's the danger or the harm of engaging in a social movement? And there is absolutely this is cause and effect, right? Um, causality. There the, for every action, there is a reaction somewhere. So this is something you must think about. It must be important. But at the same time, that's what creates that space for some social movements to begin with, right? That someone somewhere, some company, some corporation made a decision that impacted people negatively enough to raise concern collectively towards some social end. All right, brilliant. That's that's a beautiful thing about democracy, all right? So being sly, wryly uh, cynical about uh, democracy just a moment ago, now I'm shifting and saying, but let's remember the positive way democracy can work for us. You see groups such as One Million Moms issue boycotts on companies that advertise during racy or offensive primetime cable shows, and it usually ends with companies being forced to drop advertisements in certain time slots and shows being canceled. Okay, absolutely, we do see this this form of, this is a contemporary form of social movements being successful, um, interpreted as successful in the U.S., is when we shift Advertisers. Um, question here lists one million moms as uh, as as a, an online, uh, but also kind of real world action group that 
creates sparks some change okay so there was a couple of racy tv shows and i made sure i went back and tried to do as much research and reading on um their their success rate and they did protest a couple of of cable dramas um and I know I verified two advertisers that they convinced to drop off or move away from in terms of a show. Not uncommon, you know. Sometimes, in fact, cable networks uh, will 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 almost accept that as as a badge of honor. All right, FX, and this is separate study. FX in the early two thousands, mid two thousands, they had a show on um, highly uh, provocative. Uh, slightly controversial called nip tuck all right and so there's a, a, a plastic surgery melodrama and it was you know hyper misogynistic very sexist show and uh you know gratuitous and there were many advertisers that pulled right they yanked their ads they yanked their spots their, their sponsorship of that show but then fx sort of mitigated that by suggesting okay we're not for everyone all right, all right and so we're going to double down on this or we accept that some don't want to advertise we're, we're going to power forward or we're going to find exclusive partnerships all right and so then they would have these bumpers at the beginning of of an episode of shows that might be like Mercedes Benz uh, presents this episode of whatever. Okay, so then it's a larger sponsorship by a, by a singular company something like that. I think they did that with some uh, 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 liqueur companies, or, it, it, that seems to ring true. There is a shift in the 2000s where alcohol advertisements had had become out of vogue in uh, on television and a lot of print advertising, and there's this huge surge where it came back into the fold, and a lot of that uh, uh, played heavy on those on those cable programs. All right, so that's interesting to talk about. Um, but yeah, the one million miles. Some, sometimes, though, just as we said with FX, that protest can have the opposite effect. It, to give something attention is to create more attention, right? So you're bringing more eyes to the product instead of fewer. On the other hand, a lot of that product, that social protest and product advertisement yanking is what led to, uh, in addition to some like you know harassment claims and lawsuits, um, led to Fox News pulling Bill O'Reilly's show and contract or whatever right the o'reilly factor used to be like the 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 papa bear of uh cable news programming i mean number one number one number one like in the ratings and they tout all the stuff and huge advertisers and just a massive network of followers he's no longer on it he's you know he no longer has a, a televisual presence all right um that 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 social protest that that movement against his brand was effective um and uh, that you know they they also non advertising related, but the the CEO okay was also forced to resign, and now for different reasons, I think many advertisers have even recently um, pulled sponsorships from uh, Sean Hannity's uh, TV show. All right, so uh, there you know there's lots of instances where pulling advertising can have an effect because we're driven by a consumer culture, right? As much as America, the U.S. Rather, is a democracy where we're, we're, we're sort of embedded, uh, if not indebted, to capitalism. Uh, and so, you know, it's that money speaks, right? Moving money matters um, as much as deliberative democracy. Um, how does social media and growing media attention hurt or hinder social movements? Depends. Depends. To to just let's see whatever right here to just to okay depends right how social media and growing media attention can hurt or hinder because two uh, people online can be too distracted to care right this is like uh, there was a oh was it I saw a bit floating around Dave Chappelle did this bit about something horrific he saw on YouTube and he was like I was so offended. I clicked dislike, right, or whatever. The, the joke uh, went over uh, like gangbusters because the truth is, you know, we're there's a desensitization to the constant bombardment of imagery and messages and content on the internet. So um, there's that instance of we can become too distracted to care versus uh, the internet, social media can finally have or provide a platform to get our message out. 
all right? So it does flow both ways. This takes us back to the communication model, right? Sender uh, sends a message along a channel uh, to a receiver who receives, decodes, right, uh, the information, simultaneous feedback, but there's all this noise happening too. So the internet's full of noise, just as real life can be. Um, uh, but it also is that place to get our message out, right? It gives us a channel. It gives us a medium to connect with others. Uh, good questions. Why are more? Why are people more focused on trying to make the big changes rather than starting with movements with a small M approach? I don't know. I, this this is a tricky question. Um, are they? Uh, who who are we talking about? Right. This is. What, one of the things we can do, just like with our interview questions, continue to create uh, a, a more specific and concrete questions so that we can um, allow for the engagement of space to answer and discuss and reflect on this content as, uh, as, 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 more, as cohesively as possible, right? Very good, very good, very good, very good. Uh, let's, let's jump. Jump to Uzel. Why did... Okay. Emily Potter's interviewing for journalists. What did Lee mean when she said, quote, uh, looking for page one, even the humble literary interview is dying or growing old, end quote. Um, the best response I have for everyone, because you likely have that book on you, right? You all have your book um, nearby. Did you check the endnote reference? All right, at the end of that sentence, there's an endnote, number one. And that reference, what it's referencing, that work itself, if you understand that work, is, is what the author's referring to, right? A previous conversation. So sometimes this is a great pause moment to, to suggest one of the strengths of scholarship, right? Scholarly writing, that is academic writing or more sophisticated writing rather than, you know, YA novels or, you know, comic books, wink, uh, is that... Um, the research that goes into that effort is more challenging, it's more thoughtful, uh, it's more fact-checked, uh, it's, you know, I'm going to use that buzzword, peer-reviewed, sometimes double peer-reviewed, sometimes uh, double-blind peer-reviewed, right? Um, so it goes through a more stringent process um, to come out. Um, so that, that, that literary inter interview is talking about that stuffy, right, the in-note references a stuffy kind of um, um, prosy style of interview writing, uh, like you would find in, I don't know, a memoir not written by the in first person, right? A, a biography as opposed to an autobiography, or an autobiography as written by a ghost writer. <clears throat> I know we have computer cell phones with cameras and videos on them, and we have social media galore, but face-to-face -face interviews but are face-to-face -face interviews, or I don't know if this is a question or a declarative sentence, but face-to-face -face interviews still effective as they were yesteryear? Uh, maybe even more so. I'm gonna, I'm gonna make a, a sub-argument here. Maybe interviews are even more um, significant than they were because we are so starved for person-to-person -person contact and connection, all right? So um, we are very sort of separated as much as the internet brings us together, social media brings us together, the, in terms of physical interaction and sort of in a face-to-face -face time as opposed to FaceTime, um, that we, you know, this exchange, uh, you know, there's that energy you get of being across from someone or in some exchanging with someone in the same room um, that is different from if I were to, you know, Skype in one of our guest interviewees or uh, engage with you all online. As much as we seek to connect, because we are trying to connect and converge and uh, and, and simulate uh, that authentic classroom experience. So that's a great place to pause. Uh, we'll be right back with part three of our asynchronous dialogue in progress. <laughs> 